Well, good morning, folks. Um, that was really amazing, Rick. Um, and it, there's a couple of things that I think will lead well to the common themes, if you would, that all of us are going to talk about. But this theme of precision and this theme of uh, what Ed Zander many years ago coined uh, uh, a phrase of uh, seamless mobility. And in his mind, Ed, this is the former CEO of Motorola back when Motorola was a actually powerful US-based company. God knows what they are today. But anyway, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Um, the concept of seamless mobility was that technologies talk to one another. It was technology interoperability. When in fact, the reality is seamless mobility has nothing to do with technology. It has everything to do with cons the consumer. And when you think about it, a consumer would always go to their services, right? You would go to the ATM to get cash. You'd go to the doctor to get your blood glucose results. You'd go to the travel agent to get tickets. You'd go to X. Well, seamless mobility says X comes to you. Right? It's, a, it's a paradigm shift. In many ways, uh, one of the themes that I think I want to stress as we go through this is the technologies are there and they're evolving to the point where it allows the seamless delivery of not just data, well, goodness knows there's plenty of data around there, uh, but the information, knowledge, and action that's delivered at the point of care uh, to the consumer or the patient. And that's a really important theme, and I'm glad you, that you raised it because we'll amplify it throughout this. Um, disclosures, yeah, I'm an uh, uh, investor in, in WellDoc, stockholder, all that good stuff. I'm also a type 2 diabetes patient, and when I was asked to give this talk, it was less about, I said, listen, I'm happy to do it, uh, but it's less about actual activity for the sake of activity. It was more activity in the context of chronic disease. So that's where I'm going to take you today, and I'm going to show you examples of what we do with that kind of data, and more importantly, how we can structure analyses from that type of data we're gathering that I think are applicable not just to exercise, but to all the domains of data that we capture, right? So let me just start by setting up the problem statement and, and where our opportunity space is. You all know this in the sense of chronic disease. The incidence is, is uh, 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 growing outrageously, right? The costs are growing in a way that we just can't comprehend. And it's not just a G8, it, G8, G7, Russia got kicked out. Um, it's not just a, a G7 problem. It's something that's there in the uh, emergent economies as well, right? And when you think about chronic disease, as a diabetes patient, you know, I go see my doctor once every quarter to get my labs drawn, uh, but there's so many things I need to do in between. So the frequency of my intervention or my engagement with my health, literally on a day-to-day -day basis, dictates the difference between success and failure. So we have to take advantage of these teachable moments, if you would. At the same time, there's all this stuff happening on the numerator side with healthcare reform, right? And we all know this. We're shifting from, uh, if you would, volume-based care to value-based care. And we're shifting this, you know, why is it that our healthcare system pays you $20,000 to cut off your foot because you had a diabetic ulcer, but they won't pay you three bucks a month to go get a foot exam, right? I mean, why are we so focused on acute care when we should be shifting the emphasis back onto chronic and certainly preventive? And you start to think about activity and food as two, cri they're underlying in any chronic condition, right? And if we can actually manage those, we actually lower the cost burden and the incidence burden of chronic disease. At the same time, how many of you have been to the doctor recently, right? For whatever reason, right? How many of you got on the internet first? Come on, yeah, 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 me too, yeah. So we, it, we can't, we can't um, ignore this notion of consumerism, right? And I don't know if you saw it, it was, a, it was a, I don't know, three, four months ago on 60 Minutes or one of the news documentaries, a woman who had a child uh, in, in, in uh, Midwestern United States who, who uh, they didn't know what was wrong with this child. And they took them to, to Stanford, you know, Hopkins, they took them everywhere, and they couldn't figure it out. It just so happened this child had like the N plus one mutation of cystic fibrosis, okay? That they, they did, there was no test to determine it or anything. But she puts it on Facebook. And the next day she gets a hit from a lady in Russia who has a daughter that has some eerily same symptoms. And she says, ask your doctor about cystic fibrosis. Poof, right? Without the, without the social connection, there, there's no hope, right? So we have to take consumerism into account as we, as we think of this journey. At the same time, my God, if you're, uh, if you're in the, uh, uh, whether it's the pharmacologic truth, you know, drugs, or you're in the uh, uh, you know, weight loss category or whatever it is, there are so many new things that are coming out, but they all measure persistence, persistence and compliance, right? And we all know what that curve looks like. First of all, it doesn't start at 100% of things that are filled. It starts at 78%. And then the curve is abysmal. As you get down to the 12th refill, it's the 18 to 23 percentile. And it costs a lot of money, right? On average, the cost for a drug today is 8.3 billion to bring it to market, right? So as a CEO of a pharma company, your conundrum is, do I invest the extra dollar in yet another agent 
Uh, or do I perhaps invest in just lifting the curve of what I have, perhaps through modifying behavior and focusing on these baseline conditions like weight management and, and food management and things like that, activity management, etc. And then lastly, no surprises, right? There's now more, what's the statistic from e uh, uh, economists? There's more cell phones on the planet than toothbrushes and toilets, right? <laughs> When Prime Minister Modi was elected to India, right, he said, forget going to the moon, <laughs> forget that, I want a toilet for every Indian. Okay, that's a good idea. It, the honest truth is, everybody has a mobile phone. Sorry, Rick, I'm a believer, I'm, I'm saying it is mobile, right? Everybody, and here's a funny technology that knows no socioeconomic boundaries. The richest of the rich have it, the poorest of the poor have it. Everybody has a bloody cell phone, right? And they use it. On, on average, Samsung tells us that people use it 80 to 85 times a day. You look at your phone. Well, if you can actually leverage the power of that platform to guide these things at that teachable moment, at that point of care, then we all win, right? So that's our problem. You know it. In diabetes, that's what we're dealing with. I'm putting this up just to give you a magnitude of the issue, right? The scarier part is the 86 million people who are pre-diabetic, right? And the CDC predicts one out of every three after the, uh, born after the year 2000 will have diabetes, and guess what? 80% of them due to obesity. And you think of obesity as only two things that drive that, right? Really, it's food and it's activity, right? We can stop that. And, and as a type 2 diabetic, I'll just share a personal tidbit with you. My friends who have type 1 are angry at me. And they say, you don't have diabetes. You did this to yourself. I didn't. Bad Asian genes. But I understand the sentiment is the honest truth, right? They, my pancreas failed. You, you ate too much. Or you don't exercise. Uh, at, at the same time, it's not just the incidence, it's the cost, right? So this is our cost, 245 billion. And that's at the macro level. At the micro level, a patient who goes in and sees their doctor on a day-to-day -day basis, the New England Journal of Medicine calls this patient-physician discordance, right? The doctor has their objective. I want you to get your you know, cholesterol under control, blood pressure under control, A1C under control. Meanwhile, this patient's suffering from, they went through a divorce. Or, and so it's the proverbial square peg in a round hole, right? Things aren't working with the current paradigm. And that's what it feels like. To be truthful, that's the net effect of all of this when you add it up together. And we ask, there's a lot of stuff going on. Oh my God, there's oh, this sensor and that sensor and, and this drug and that drug and this app and that app. And, and look, I have a new blood glucose meter and you know it counts down from five, not six. And I don't care, I have a hole in my finger. I'll just hold it down for an extra second. So people are innovating, but they're innovating in ways that don't necessarily matter to what we need, right? And so I ask a very simple question. Are we focused on the wrong problem? Are we all focusing on the wrong problem? I love the picture because the, guy, the guy's hands broke, but the vase didn't, right? Are we focusing on the wrong problem? And I would assert in this domain, of understanding chronic disease and the effect of activity, that we only have two problems. In fact, I think it's only two problems for all of healthcare, very bluntly. One is the right data is not getting to the right person at the right place at the right time. But that's the problem of connectivity. Every other industry has solved that, right? Right? You're, you get your tips on when to buy and sell your stock. Why can't you get your tips on when to exercise and what type of exercise and what type of food and et cetera, et cetera, right? Why can't we do that? At the same time, that's the easier problem. We can just import what other industries have done. The harder problem is one of behavior management. How do we convert that data into information, knowledge, action, and ultimately outcomes on behalf of that patient or consumer in a, measure, in a, man, in a manner that's smart, which means what? Specific, measurable, actionable, and real time. If it has those attributes, then we actually have a way out of this, right? So is there hope? At the end of the day, I do believe so. I think that there's hope with this mobile platform and what we can do. So what did we do? Um, when you think about any good mobile health platform, it should have several pillars, if you would. It should have several common, what we call platform elements. So a key part of this is managing meds, right? And managing meds is not just drug to drug interaction. It's not just a reminder to take a med. New England Journal of Medicine, September 2011, uh, uh, the September 2011 uh, said, non-contextually generated SMS messages that remind a patient to take a drug don't work. If it were that simple, J&J &J would have sold alarm clocks with their drugs 25 years ago. That's not why people don't take the drugs they're supposed to take. Oh, I don't want to take insulin. Why not? Well, I don't want to take insulin. Why not? Grandma died when she was on insulin. Well, grandma probably died on because she started it too late. She was probably dead when she started taking insulin, right? But you have to break down the psychosocial there, right? And so med management is important. Symptom management is important. Lifestyle management, which is really what I'm going to hone in on. 
how do you manage all of the diet, exercise, stress reduction? How do you manage that with emerging technology in the right way for that patient at the right time that's precise to them, right? That's not some population base that doesn't apply to me. And lastly, physiologic, things that I can actually measure. And so you now enter stage left, all the different activity monitors that they have. So this is fascinating, right? Um, there was a recent study that was done that showed that people who wear Fitbits actually gained weight. I don't know if all you saw that. They gained weight. And then they went and asked these people why. They're like, well, I, was, I, th I, I, I thought I was tracking, so I felt I was good, so I ate more. <laughs> and so that's interesting. That's, yeah, dead serious. So, so it's interesting. Uh, you wear it. Is it, driving the necessary, uh, is it driving the necessary behavior? At the same time, without the raw data coming from these things, who goes to an app and, and types in all this stuff? Who goes and says, I walked for so many miles, or I took this many steps? Nobody does, right? It's the same way that they don't go and enter into food journal. This is what I, because it's just not easy, right? So the question is, how do you take the data from these things? And I'll give you a framework in a second. How do you take the data from these sensors, plethora of sensors, and they're all good, by the way, but how do you convert that data into information, knowledge, action, and outcomes? So I'll give you a couple of examples. So here's a, a just a screenshot of one of our functions in our Blue Star application, so you can see the logbook. And here, when I click on my logbook, I can scroll down, and I can see, for example, the steps that I've taken, and I can even see my sleep, because I've connected my, in my case, I sleep with my phone, because I, I have my Samsung Health uh, 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 application turned on my phone, or if it's a job owner, a Fitbit, or an or a Apple Health Kit, doesn't matter. But I can see that uh, uh, I have feedback on my sleep. And this is hugely important. One of the biggest uh, ahas in the last almost five years is the relationship between fasting blood glucose and amount of sleep and quality of sleep. And it is on all things being equal, there's a, there's a huge uh, correlation factor between somebody's fasting uh, uh, blood sugar, their A1C control, and the amount of sleep that they get on a day-to-day -day basis. And so here's a quick way, for example, to say an important part of activity is how do I take advantage of that and provide feedback to the patient suggesting this is what you might alter, this is what you need to do, and maybe tomorrow night I won't do the same thing, right? At the same time, I think the, one, of the, one of the most prominent use cases is a patient who, uh, they wake up every morning, they test their fasting blood glucose, and it's good. They're, uh, but their A1C is 9, and they don't know why their A1C is 9, because they have a problem with postprandial. They have a problem with meals. Either they're consuming too much, uh, too many carbs, or they're consuming a portion that's too large, or they're just eating the wrong types of foods, right? All of them are, you never want to judge the patient. So you never want to say any one of those is wrong. How do you just get them back into the rails? And so clinically, normally you would tell them, okay, if your postprandial sugar is high, you know, take X number of units of your short-acting insulin or take Y drug or whatever. But now, all of a sudden, because you have this fitness monitor connected, and, and I have a history of their blood glucose uh, uh, trends against their exercise trends, I now have a transfer function. And I can say, look, I have this transfer function. Hey, you know what? Every time you uh, uh, walked you know, X number of steps, you dropped your glucose by Y number of uh, milligrams per deciliter. Hey, it's really nice outside today. GPS on the phone plots a nice walking path. It is a beautiful campus here, by the way. Um, walk and have at it. So what do patients call this in English? They call it choice. You're now giving them a choice. So it's like when you put into your GPS when you're driving from you know, Washington to New York or, or, and you say, I want to avoid freeways or avoid tolls. You'll still get there, but you have a choice. And, and patients have told us we love to have that choice. And now I can set parameters. Hey, if it's raining outside, I'm not going to do this. I, I, I may take my uh, extra shot of uh, Epidra after lunch to bring my glucose value down. But now all of a sudden you've taken what otherwise is raw fitness data, data for the sake of data, but you've now extracted value from it. And you've extracted value in the context of a very important metric. In this case, their daily blood glucose or their estimated average glucose or their A1C. This is an easy one, right? Um, uh, having that raw data in terms of how long I went on my bicycle, uh, the duration, the number of calories that I burned, again, I can take that information and now parlay it back, in fact, now I start to think about what Rick just said in his last slide. Imagine if I biked to the restaurant. And, and now, instead of, in, it knows that I just burned 600 calories, 
and my BG is fallen by 25 or 35 or 45 mg per deciliter, maybe I can have that piece of fried chicken. Sorry, you didn't hear me say that, right? <laughs> maybe I can have that piece. Of, all of a sudden, you're giving the patient choice. So you think about none of the, so this is the power of these solutions, right? These solutions have to interoperate with one another. These solutions are all part of a broader ecosystem around who? The patient or the consumer, because they provide them total holistic care for their condition, not just bits and pieces, right? So when you think about, this is an interesting, uh, last, last one I think is, this is a part of a report that goes back to the provider. And now the provider can see, in fact, the patient can see on the report, look at the difference between how I did on days when I act, had activities versus days when I didn't. I can see a stark difference in my numbers. So visually, the correlation between my activity, and of course, I can see it projected as a drop in A1C, that's even better. So you're now hitting not just the patient, you're hitting the provider by taking this combined fitness information and putting it into the context of their disease. So when you think about, step out of all of this muck and think about, the, uh, think about what we're actually trying to parlay here from a data standpoint, we shared this with the National Institutes of Health and the uh, FDA at their first joint symposium. And the thought here is that if I look at the data that I capture in healthcare, so there's a yin yang here, right? There's a, the data that I capture, and then there's what I do with that data, right? And so the data that I capture, if you think about frequency and source, I would assert that all of our healthcare data today sits in this bottom left quadrant. It's data that's coming at a low frequency, perhaps once every quarter, once every year, if it's claims data, and it's coming from a system. It's either coming from a lab, an EMR, or a claims management system, right? And you can see this, and yet, all of the therapy changes that a patient and provider make are based on this sometimes quite outdated data. Well, what digital technology and what these new tools allow us is it three vectors of data expansion. First, you have this data that's coming from a low frequency, but it's coming from the patient. And it could be their meal preferences, it could be their exercise preferences, it could be their psychosocial preferences. You think about, you know, I, I tend to do this. I tend to go on like I really want to eat Asian this week and next week I don't want to have any Asian because I, maybe I do want to have that plate of spaghetti. Or you know what, I'm sick and tired of sitting on my bike. I want to do something else. Those things don't change every day. They may change over weeks. They may change over months. So there's a lower frequency of that. But it's coming from me, right? And then, of course, there's the high frequency data. There's data that's coming from the system itself, KPIs or alerts. And then lastly, of course, there's the data that's coming all the time from the patient, right? Whether it's from the patient's self-input or it's coming from their sensors. So now, all of a sudden, these tools have given us a vast amount of data. We ask a very simple question, what do you do with it? So in a very parallel fashion, I want to share this. We call it idea, which I'll, I'll build out in a second, that says one vector is I have data or I don't. And the second vector in the y-axis is I know what I'm looking for or I don't with my analysis intent. So play it out. I have data. I know what I'm looking for. We call that informative analysis. That says, tell me the percentage of times A or B or C happened. Show me what happened on Tuesdays when I exercised. Show me what happened when I was biking versus I was walking. Show me what happened and show me what happened could be to my glucose. It could be my heart rate, whatever your uh, 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 dependent variable is, right? But this is math 101. This is just reporting. As soon as I inform the heck out of what I want to do, I then go north in the quadrant. This is what we call discovery. And it says, okay, I have data, but I don't know what I'm looking for. Can I learn something from that data? Oh, like the blood glucose transfer function on exercise. Oh, wow, this is actually fascinating. On weekends, your transfer function is this, but on weekdays, your transfer function is this. Why? So the bottom quadrant asks, answers the question, tell me what happened. The top quadrant answers the question, tell me why it happened, right? And now you have the ability to zero in and understand the effect, if you would, of exercise variables on, right? And then once you've discovered a pattern of interest, it could be an exercise pattern, it could be a testing pattern, it could be a medication pattern, whatever pattern it is, you come down to this quadrant where we call extrapolate. I wanted to call it predict, but IDPA doesn't spell anything, so we call it IDEA, right? So extrapolate is the idea of pr predictive modeling. I now know what I'm looking for, but I don't have the data. Can I actually predict what will happen? Can I actually predict if I do walk an additional uh, mile, what would the delta be with my uh, blood glucose? Or if I do uh, uh, play football uh, uh, on a field and I'm an asthmatic, 
uh, and they've just mowed the lawn because I have uh, the parks, national parks database that says, you know, this is when we come and uh, mow lawns. Should I take an extra puff of my Simbacort so that I don't end up in the ER that night? These are all easy, easy uh, uh, mathematical manipulations to do because all of this data exists, right? Unlike the case where it's restaurant databases that I wish somebody would publish for all of our uh, uh, sake, uh, 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 you know, uh, the million restaurants, but all this other stuff about pollen count, air quality index, all of that stuff's out there. So we tap into that very quickly. So this answers the question, this answers the question in the bottom, tell me what happened, tell me why it happened, tell me when it will happen again. And when it will happen again could be a good event, I want to predict a good event, it could be a bad event that I want to thwart. In our case, the most stark example of the bottom right-hand quadrant is hypoglycemia. It's got nothing to do with medication or uh, with, uh, with exercise. But if I can knock out that incidence of hypoglycemia, I knock out one-third of the ER or acute utilization visits. Out of, that, out of that 245 billion, I knock out about 70 billion of cost with one digital function, which is pretty amazing when you think of the ROI of these types of... And then lastly, I neither have the data nor do I know what I'm looking for. We call that adaptive. You close the loop and you start over again. And so what's fascinating about this is not just the fact that you have fitness monitoring, activity monitoring, sleep monitoring data, you've actually been able to extract value from that data that ultimately drives a better health outcome and puts the patient in a better place in a better place of control. So for those of you who are interested, my good friend Dr. Malpani in, in Mumbai just published his book. It is, it in many ways, information therapy is a critical part of what the patient therapy and the physician uh, guidance is going to be on a go forward basis. And it's enabled by the technologies Rick talked about. It's enabled by these activity monitor sensors, but it's not just the presence of the data. It has to be what we do with the data. Otherwise, it's all useless. It's all noise, right? So, you know, uh, uh, I, 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 tongue in cheek, um, but I think it's true, right? At the end of the day, these are going to be part of the fabric of, the, of, the, of how we deliver healthcare on a go forward basis. And I'll, I'll just leave you with this last thought, which for me, is, a, is very real as a patient, which is, at the end of the day, um, the, worst, the worst thing, folks, about having a chronic condition is loneliness. Uh, and we all know it statistically, right? The number of patients in chronic conditions who have undiagnosed depression is, uh, ranges between 28 and 37 percent. And as soon as you go down that path of loneliness, bad things happen. And it's, it's like a spiral, this abyss of misery. Uh, that it's very difficult to pull yourself out of. But if technology is a means to get you out of that rut, if it's, a, if it's a means to pull you out and engage you in the way you want to be engaged, whether it's with your diet, whether it's with your nutrition, whether it's with your activity, then you have hope. And I, I want people to take away that in many ways, these things not just transform care, they don't just transform outcomes, they don't just transform, they give hope because they give people that leg uh, to stand up on that they never had before. So I'll leave you with that last thought and we'll take questions in the panel. Thank you.